Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. U.S. military technology has grown by leaps and bounds over the last century. But perhaps no mode of transportation has experienced more development and advancement than the fighter jet. Today, we'll be discussing the unique abilities of the AV-8B Harrier. The plane was the first in the world to be in service that incorporated a vertical style landing and takeoff, which allowed the aircraft to behave like a helicopter and fly like a plane. Development on what we now know as the AV-8B began in the 1970s. It was a joint effort between the United Kingdom and the United States. The revolutionary aircraft underwent several iterations. with British Aerospace and Boeing engineers participating in its technological evolution. The bodies of AV-8B jets are different from other military aircraft in that the cockpit is elevated and the plane's wings are high mounted, swept back and tapered with a negative slant. The plane can be armed with missiles, bombs, rockets, and more. But its most unique and important asset is its ability to land and take off vertically, like a helicopter. This quality makes the AV-8B one of the most versatile assets the military has developed. The plane is essential in both offensive and defensive operations, as well as in humanitarian crisis. Thanks to the thrusts that allow the AV-8B to lift off straight into the air and then blast forward at supersonic speeds, it doesn't need a long runway. Of course, not every flight goes perfectly. On June 7, 2014, U.S. Marine Corps Captain William Mahoney took off from the USS Bataan while at sea. He soon realized the AV-8B's landing gear had a problem. So it was a normal flight day. Um, we were going out to repunch currency for landing at the ship in the evening. There was nothing crazy about it. Uh, I took off and uh, as I was climbing away from the deck, I uh, put my gear up. I realized I had a gear malfunction. Captain Mahoney said a jet pilot in the tower who could survey the situation from below could see what was wrong. As Mahoney hovered at just 300 feet, he was told his nose gear had not come back down. At this point, it's time to figure out how do I get the jet back on the deck safely with only three landing gear. The ship's engineers had prepared for this exact situation. Crews deployed an apparatus that resembled a stool. It was placed on the deck in the exact place where the landing gear that holds up the nose of the plane would normally go. Inch by inch, Mahoney carefully and expertly maneuvered the plane onto the stool. 
He said it took nerves of steel and precise handling of the aircraft so that the nose of the plane could be positioned perfectly into the makeshift harness. Not only did he exit the aircraft without a scratch, but the plane was uninjured as well. That saved the Marines a lot of money. Each of these AV-8Bs cost the military more than $20 million to build. For safety purposes, the USS Patan's flight deck was cleared of all personnel during Mahoney's landing, just in case something went wrong. Once the mission was accomplished and the plane shut off, sailors rushed towards the cockpit to check on Mahoney and to congratulate him on a job well done. What makes AV-8B so special and so valuable is that they can perform exactly the same way they do at sea on an aircraft carrier or smaller vessel as they do on land. Other high-performance planes capable of taking off and landing on aircraft carriers must use the ship's launch and recovery system. A slingshot mechanism propels the plane to take flight. When landing on an aircraft carrier, most planes hook on to a deceleration system in order to not overshoot the deck. Sometimes on land, when an airport is not nearby, the military must build runways that are as short as those on aircraft carriers. These remote airfields are called Short Airfields for Tactical Support, or SATs. They are built quickly. The first step is to clear trees and brush, so that the strip where the makeshift runway will be is level. Equipment used for the separate construction included compactor, motor grader, and skid steer and we use tools and equipment and the standard AM2 Air Force toolkit for building the pad itself to install the matting and the cruciform stakes. The temporary runways normally need to be at least 2,000 to 3,000 feet long. Watertight, interlocking planking is put down so planes have a flat surface and proper grip for landing. This planking can also hold the catapult and the arresting gear. This helps planes take off quickly and land safely and suddenly on these shorter runways. This video, shot at the Moody Air Force Base in Georgia, shows how the BAK-12 aircraft arrest system works. Watch as an F-15 fighter jet traveling at the speed a landing jet might be traveling hooks on the line placed across the tarmac. The rope provides the resistance to help the jet stop quickly. Short runways on small bases sometimes come with big problems. Because they're often built in the middle of a cleared forest or jungle, 
wildlife can interfere with jets taking off and landing. Pilots that fly into and out of JBSA Randolph Base in San Antonio, Texas know this all too well. Surrounded by a bird sanctuary, the runways on the base are monitored by men and women that attempt to scare off birds. They do this by blasting the sound of predatory birds. Pyrotechnics are also shot into the sky. This helps disperse flocks flying too close to the runways. It doesn't always work. In January 2014, a bird flew into a T-38 engine during takeoff. The price tag to get that aircraft up and running again was nearly a quarter of a million dollars. Thankfully, no one was hurt in the strike. At this airfield in Bangram, Afghanistan, a USDA Wildlife Service representative is charged with one job, to keep birds and other wildlife from being sucked into jet engines. We don't want to see an aircraft go down because of a bird strike, so that's my ultimate goal is to keep everybody in the sky safe, uh, which keeps all of us on the ground safe. Uh, most of the time when they strike, it just bounces off the aircraft, but we don't want to take that chance because all it takes is one time for it to ingest the right, the right way and then it, you know, a plane have a drastic problem. If a plane does experience an emergency, pilots are prepared. Flight simulators are used to help them train for a worst case scenario. Pilots will suit up in the jumpsuit, helmet, and oxygen mask that they usually wear in flight. In this simulator, the 360-degree screen and virtual reality software place them behind the yoke of an F-16 Fighting Falcon. The mission rehearsal begins. The simulator allows pilots to encounter real-life problems in a controlled environment. They could experience the effects of flying upside down. practicing using weapon systems, and rehearse their response if the plane was to be shot down or had an engine failure. During the practice flight, the pilot is also able to communicate with a coach, as they normally would an air traffic control center. Of course, this training and technology is part of what makes U.S. Air Force pilots so great at their job. And also why you cannot hear any audio in this video. The sound was not cleared for release to the public, likely because some of the techniques employed and words spoken by the pilot and his coach were classified. Whether in training or real life, the U.S. military is ready for anything. From jets that can take off vertically from nearly any location, makeshift runways assembled in mere minutes, there is rarely a location where the U.S. military cannot get access in order to defend and protect or conduct a special operation. And while the Department of Defense is tasked with protecting the people of the United States, they are also protective of U.S. armed forces. Including the pilots who put themselves in harm's way as they fly these planes and use weapons of war.
That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.